Hey there, and welcome back to another Miraculous Ladybug Season 4 review. And today we'll be discussing the latest episode to drop, Wishmaker. And to make a long story short, this is one of my favourite episodes of the season, and potentially of all time. I mean, it's such a fever dream of an episode that was so ridiculously hilarious, and yet still managed to push the plot forward in a meaningful way. But without giving too much away, let's get into the episode. We start off the episode in Marinette's class where the principals come to explain to them about the careers expo that's taking place and how they should attend to figure out what they want to do after school with Marinette handing out pamphlets to her classmates. Almost immediately, Chloe unleashes her negative attitude and tells the class that the expo's pointless and that she already knows what she wants to be. Rich. As well as telling Marinette that she's ridiculous. Bullying aside for a moment, what Chloe said speaks to me on a spiritual level. When I was in high school, I always found these expos to be completely pointless. They're always so needlessly vague with what the different jobs actually entail and what you have to do to get to that point. I feel like the only reason they have them is so schools can take credit when somebody actually follows through with one of the booths and becomes successful in that career path. At least, that's what my school seems to do. Also, good on Chloe for being realistic about her dreams. She wants to be rich. I feel like when I was in school, it was always about doing the job that makes you happy. Too bad those jobs never seem to pay that much, so you get saddled with crippling debt and slowly grow to hate your once beloved career choice. And yes, I am projecting. Now let's get back to the episode. The principal then tells the class that it's important that they all choose their own path before he dashes off to change into his owl superhero costume. First things first, impressive how fast he manages to put that thing on. But come on mate, still doing the whole owl superhero gimmick? I can't imagine somebody being so cringy as to still do something like this when they live in a city where there are legit superheroes. This part of the scene actually makes me feel sick with cringe. I really, really don't like it. Take off the costume! We then move on to Adrian's room where, surprise, surprise, he's depressed because his dad's controlling ways have left him emotionally stunted and now he has no idea what career path he wants to take in life. But let's be real, as if his dad would actually give him a choice. A man so deranged as to put innocent lives at risk regularly just to bring back his wife from a magical coma is pretty unlikely to allow his son to follow his passions. You'll be a model son, and you'll like it. Now go to your fencing classes. I don't care if you're 40 years old. My house, my rules. Am I right? Plague then asks him if he'd want to be Cat Noiris' career path. To which Adrian complains that Ladybug's been giving out Miraculous to different heroes so much recently that he thinks he isn't even needed. Hmm. That's actually kind of true. That is happening a lot, and Cat Noir has not been a very relevant hero recently. He's really not been doing much at all. Fight villains, get beaten, get saved by Ladybug and the other hero, rinse, repeat. But on the other hand, I also think Plague's onto something here. Cat Noir should start up a Patreon or something. Considering how much they save Paris, I feel like it's only fair he gets something out of it. Hell, maybe when he's older he should start an OnlyFans. Let's be real. The character in canon is considered attractive, and he wears a black skin-tight bodysuit. People are going to pay for those pics, I guarantee it. Got to afford that kibble somehow. I'm not going to judge. And then Plague moves on to suggest that they open a cheese shop together. And honestly, this is another golden idea that would be a mega hit. Seriously, considering they're international celebrities, a cheese shop where you're able to meet the real-life Cat Noir and buy his branded cheese product would earn mega bucks. It would be like if Captain America opened his own gym and you could go train with him. Man, maybe Plague isn't as stupid as the show tries to make him seem. Adrian, inspired by Plague's enthusiasm, decides to visit the food trade booths to see what path in life he wants to take. And side note, this feels like a lead into what the fandoms constantly sprouted and hinted at since We're Dad. Adrian will totally become an apprentice baker to Tom and take over that family bakery. It's something completely different from his past life, living in a cosy house, and he can even model for Marinette if he wants to on the side. Anyway, we then transition to Marinette, who for some reason has no idea what she wants to do. And I thought for sure she wanted to be a designer of some kind, considering she created the hat for Gabe and also designed Jagged Stone's album cover, but I guess not, because she completely blanks out, and then the Kwamis low-key make fun of her hobbies, saying that a true life calling is pining after Adrian and Luca and making them presents. And I know they were just trying to help and be nice, but Jesus, savage. They're like five-year-olds that just speak the truth without realizing how rude they're being. I kind of love it. So then she decides to also visit the career booths to try and see what she wants to do. But let's be real. This was only so she could be in the same place as Adrian and will probably have next to no effect on her future career or storyline. We then transition to the Careers Expo where local oxygen thief Alec is hosting a TV program that actively makes fun of people's jobs and mocks them about their life. And why? 
Why would somebody want to make something like this? Jesus! Anyway, his first attempted victim is Andre, the sweet ice cream man who crafts his own ice cream and then matches it to your personality. And he decides that this is the perfect person to mock, simply because he has a cart, not a store, and because he chooses your flavour for you. Even though that's what makes him unique. And also, the crowd can just go and burn in hell, because they laugh at this guy's attempts to tease this very friendly, kind man. Like, what? Who would laugh at this? <laughs> Let's laugh at the ice cream man. Good one, Baldy. Andre replies that only he can do what he does, and that people come to him to experience magical moments. Which of course prompts more teasing from Alec, who tells him it's not a real job. Really? Selling ice cream out of a cart doesn't count as a real job? Selling food from a stall is like one of the original jobs. Like probably one of the first jobs ever. Come on now, Alec, is your brain as smooth as your head? Andre, thank God, then slaps him down and tells him he's right. It's not a job. It's a career. And then the crowd reacts in shock and disgust as if Andre's just stripped naked in front of them. Why are they so shocked that this man's standing up for himself and his job? And why are they even acting like it's a huge smackdown on Alec? As far as they're aware, the dude has a pretty successful TV career. He's on every TV show we see, and Andre's comeback wasn't even that great yet. But he doesn't stop there, as Andre continues to absolutely obliterate him giving him a custom ice cream, lime for the sourness he has on the inside, and chocolate and cinnamon for the little tiny bit of sweetness he has left. Get wrecked, son! But also, lime and cinnamon? I'm not convinced with that, Andre. Also, why the hell in the English dub does Andre have such a pronounced accent when all the other characters don't? Aren't they all French? It's like in Beauty and the Beast when only Lumiere the Candle has a French accent, despite literally every character being French. Anyway, Andre tells him that one day Alec might figure out what he truly wants to be, prompting Alec to scream cut and to walk off. Marinette then approaches Andre herself and asks how he knew that he wanted to make and sell ice cream as his job. And then he spouts some BS about selling ice cream not being a job. Well, yes it is, mate. You do it as your way to earn the majority of your money. It's your job. The kid is asking for advice, not asking for a lesson in philosophical thinking. Anyway, he then makes her an ice cream, strawberry and cherry for the indecisive lady, and pistachio and pecan for the clear-sighted young man, revealing Lucas lingering behind Marinette. Jesus, dude, personal space. Don't just sneak up on people like that. Who are you? Edward Cullen? Especially when it's somebody you have a previous romantic history with, and who's only just stopped avoiding you. Anyway, as they walk, Marinette asks him why he's at the expo, because he already knows what he wants to do. With Luca replying that he's in charge of his school's booth, where he tells people about making stringed instruments. And that's a cool job, not gonna lie. But that being said though, Luca, you are fired. He is in charge of the booth, but he has left it unattended. And from what I understand, these are handcrafted instruments, yeah? I see acoustic guitars, electric guitars, and I don't know, are those lutes and mandolins as well? So I'm thinking that literally everything here is handmade. And some quick Google searching leads me to believe that most of these pieces are going to sell for a lot of money. Most handcrafted guitars, lutes, and other stringed instruments I could see were selling for thousands of dollars. So there are tens of thousands of dollars worth of instrument in that booth. And he left it unattended to get some ice cream. Mate. Anyway, moving on, Marinette tells him he's so lucky to know exactly what he wants to do, with her being unsure about what path to take, being torn between heaps of different creative careers. But surely she could just do all those things, right? Gabriel Agress seems to do anything he wants. Fashion, perfume, hell, remember that canned oxygen thing he tried? Considering how talented she is and how much success she's already had, she should have no problem with this. It feels like she's being forced to be indecisive by the writing, even though it doesn't really make sense. Anyway, in an attempt to inspire her, he shows her the very first guitar he made himself, which apparently took him two years. Hope he's managed to cut down on the time it takes since then, because... Otherwise, good luck paying rent, dog. Anyway, Alec then decides to make an appearance at this point to mock Luca's job, and so Luca grabs his violin and leads them all outside to some beachy looking area, once again, leaving the thousands of dollars worth of instruments unattended to somehow prove him wrong. But like, why would Alec even follow him? To make him look even more stupid? He already has the original clips, why follow up with this? And then he holds up the violin like he's presenting baby Simba to the Pride Lands and allows the wind to play a little song. And then he tells Alec that the musical instruments fill the space, and the space fill the instruments. And somehow this makes Alec cry. Surely this would make good TV. It's such a stupid thing to say, he looks crazy. And it's not proved anything at all. 
Just because his handmade violin sounded nice doesn't mean a factory-made one wouldn't also be nice. What did he prove, other than the fact that he's an irresponsible stall handler? And why doesn't Alec just cut that part out and just play the first segment? They can easily cut out the beach part and make Luca look like an idiot. Oh well. After Marinette tells Luca that he always knows just what to say, Luca notices Adrian, which prompts Marinette to cowl behind him, asking if he saw them. Marinette then notices that Adrian looks sad, which prompts Luca to grab her hand and walk her over there to talk to him. And man, Luca's such a chad. Anyway, Adrian reveals to them that he visited every single stall and still doesn't know anything about what he wants to do. And so his dad's probably going to decide for him, which prompts Luca and Marinette to sit with him. After Luca tells him he never really thought modelling actually fit Adrian, Adrian tells him that he only does it because he thought he could be content to do what his dad tells him to do, like Luca does with music, or like Marinette, who's always wanted to be a fashion designer. And then, they all say it's way more complicated than that, and ha ha ha, it's all so funny, they said the exact same thing. Let's all laugh. Luca then explains that he doesn't want to be a musician, he just makes music because it's in his nature. But more, he just wants people to be able to experience music, so that's why he wants to make more instruments instead. Whilst both Marinette and Adrian realise they're both completely lost. And then Luca begins to morph into a spirit guru and tells them that they need to learn how to listen to their inner melody. He then leans in awkwardly close to Marinette and tells her she's like a brass band where all the instruments are playing a different tune, whereas Adrian's a happy melody being drowned out by a sad piano tune. Yeah, sure mate. That doesn't seem like pseudoscience hogwash at all. Anyway, he tells them eventually they'll find their path and they need to let their malady flow. We get it. You like music. Why is everything with you music based? Do you not have any other interests? He then belts out an epic violin number and we move back to Alec, who's this time picking on a wig maker. And of course the baldy would be mad about somebody making wigs. Projecting much, Alec? Well, actually, yes, it turns out he is projecting because when he puts on the wig, he remembers he used to have a truly glorious afro and shaved it off because people laughed at him and obviously he then became jaded and bitter and a bully. And then he starts crying that he's wasted his life. Ugh. I kind of feel bad for him, but also not really because, you know, he's a bully. And then of course, here comes good old Gabe to send out Nakuma and turn him into Wishmaker who turns people into what they dreamed of being as a child. And as villains go, this one actually doesn't seem that bad. Unless you dreamed of being a serial killer as a kid, because, yeah, well, that can't end well. And then Wishmaker starts to unleash on Paris, starting by turning a toy maker who looks suspiciously like Geppetto from Pinocchio into Santa Claus, and continuing by turning Jagged Stone into a crocodile, who proceeds to somehow instantly find Luca, Marinette, and Adrian, despite the fact that he was in his limo, not at the expo, and says hello before they all get bombarded by Santa dropping presents and almost killing them all. And what's in those boxes? An anvil? A bowling ball? Jesus, Santa. Cool your jets. Also, Jacket Stone as a crocodile running away in fear made me cackle. And then they get confronted by another person living their dream. As a giant murder robot who decides to turn them all to mush and tries to kill them. How friendly. Chad Luca hides Marinette in the changing rooms before getting the robot's attention, getting it to shoot lasers at him and chase him away before he's saved by a newly transformed ladybug who takes him back to the stalls to hide. But, being the chat he is, he goes to check on Marinette, who isn't there anymore. But conveniently, just before he can figure it out, he hears his dad drowning and goes to save him. And I honestly think the visual of a crocodile flailing in the water being saved by a human is going to stick with me for some time. And their relationship's low-key becoming one of the funniest parts of the show. Jagan's just such a spud, and I love it. We then cut to Ladybug and Cat Noir as they take down the big robot and face off against Wishmaker. And this is where the episode devolves into a full-on fever dream. With a fireman turned into a cowboy fireman hybrid, and another person turned into a cucumber who rolls down the street shouting, Look, I'm a cucumber! The randomness is honestly hilarious and was very much appreciated, if I'm honest. Wishmaker starts to shoot at them trying to transform them, with Ladybug telling Cat Noir to be careful, as it would remove their costumes and reveal who they are, as obviously they didn't wish to be Ladybug or Cat Noir as kids. Ladybug then tells him that as a kid she wanted to be the knitting fairy, whilst Cat Noir doesn't say anything, as he doesn't even remember what he wanted to be, with Ladybug telling him he probably just forgot. And I really like this interaction. It's one of those rare moments where Cat Noir's actually serious with Ladybug, and she gets to see a different side of him. But she almost can't believe it because of how silly he usually is. And I like that she tried to reassure him in her own way, just truly believing that he would have his own dream. It's a pretty small moment, but it definitely felt like a bit of progress towards them being closer friends. 
She then decides that they're going to need Viperion for his second chance power, and so off she goes to find Luca, whilst Cat Noir holds off Wishmaker. We then cut to Luca, who's lying exhausted on the beach with his crocodile dad, telling him that crocodiles should know how to swim. With Jagged replying that he didn't when he was a kid, and so that means he's somehow forgotten, I guess? It's a completely throwaway line, but for some reason it stuck with me as one of the funnier lines of the episode. Ladybug then turns up and asks Jagged if she can have a word with his son, and Jagged's just all like, Yeah, sure. <laughs> what? Surely he'd think, Hmm, that's a bit suspicious. Surely. Especially when neither of them come back, and then Viperion would be on the news, right? No? Seems like Ladybug's getting more and more relaxed with these identities, I think. She even took Julika while she was with Luca in the last episode. Anyway, on some random rooftop, Ladybug tells Luca to transform and use his power straight away so they can always come back to that exact moment in case their identities get discovered. He then powers up and uses Second Chance, and then Ladybug uses Lucky Charm to reveal... A dinosaur plush toy. And now I kind of want one. We then cut to Cat Noir where he's fending off Wishmaker, who keeps asking him to let him live his childhood dream, prompting Cat Noir to sadly say, he doesn't have any. And then for some reason, Adrian is stupid enough to let him try and use his power on him. Seriously? Mate, come on, if you're that desperate, run away, turn off your miraculous before you go and do something stupid. Way to risk the mission. More and more, he's becoming the worst hero on the show, and I kind of feel like this was really out of character writing for him. He makes mistakes, yes, but I don't think he's actively stupid like he is here. I get that he's kind of depressed and lonely, but he's still pretty resilient as we've seen in literally every season finale, so why do this to him? Asterisk, you've done him dirty. Anyway, Viperion saves him whilst Ladybug asks around about who wants the Dino Huggy, before she gets hit by a deflected shot, revealing her identity to Luca and Shadow Moth, prompting Luca to go back to fix it. And also, I can't help but feel bad for Gabe. He was so excited to have finally won! Oh well, better luck next time. On their second run, instead of saving Cat Noir, Luca leads Marinette straight to the Dino Huggy Man, which leaves Cat Noir to smooth brain himself into getting hit, revealing that he's Adrian, and that his childhood dream was being whatever his parents wanted him to be. So, this was sad. Imagine having no dreams as a kid, and just wanting your parents' love. That's it. His parents suck. Both of them. I know it seems like his dad's only bad because they lost his mum, but based on this, they're just both awful and controlling parents. Definitely more hints that Emily wasn't the angel that Adrian makes her out to be. And who would I be if I didn't now plug my theory video about this very subject? Go check that out. Man, this was dank. And now Luca knows both Ladybug and Cat Noir's identities. And I hope this actually becomes plot relevant at some point. And also, a round of applause for all the theorists that feel vindicated right now. I honestly didn't really see this coming up until Marinette's stuff last episode, and even then, I wasn't quite sure. And then Viperion takes us back again. Third time's the charm. On the third run, Luca sends Marinette to set up the Dino Huggy Man before deflecting the attack meant for Adrian at him instead, turning him to a giant Dino Huggy whom Marinette then sends to go and hug Wishmaker, trapping him and allowing him to destroy his staff, de and fix everything, before giving Alec a charm, who decides he's going to help people with a new TV show. So, he's going to become less of an oxygen thief. Thank God. Also, did he just steal the Wigmaker's wig? We then cut away to an alleyway where Luke is handing back the Miraculous to Ladybug, who thanks him for helping them, until she catches on that he used the second chance and begins to worry that he learned her true identity. And then he full-on lies about it. And I guess I understand. With him being set up as the second coming of Aristotle in the field of emotional intelligence, he probably understands that Marinette isn't ready yet, but he clearly still feels guilty. And it begs the question though, of whether this is going to apply to Adrian. And I'm going to hedge my bets and say, he's actually going to tell him that he knows his cat noir because of how lonely and lost he is. And I think that makes sense from a story perspective, because that means Adrian gets his own confidant like Marinette has. Although, I doubt he'll tell him who Ladybug is though. He wouldn't betray her trust like that, and he already feels bad enough about lying to Marinette. Especially after the first episode of this season establishing that he's all about the truth. We then finish up the episode with Adrian thinking about how it's okay that he didn't have any childhood dreams, because now he can focus on the future. Whilst Marinette decides that she's going to do it all, like I said earlier that she should do. I know, I'm a genius. And also, can we just slide on back a second to Adrian saying it's all good he had no childhood dreams? Like, no it isn't. That's negligent parenting, champ. <sighs> Poor kid. But this does look good for him. He's consciously making the decision to fight for what he wants, and he's slowly moving away from his controlling parents. Good for you. And also, how does Alec get a new show greenlit, shot, and on air by the end of the day? Because I'm pretty sure it's the same day. 
No wonder he seems to host everything. He's efficient. And then that brings us to the end, and I loved this episode. Yeah, some of it was really stupid, but most of it was so absurdly ridiculous and stuck in my mind for ages after it ended. And I feel like an episode that sticks with you and makes you keep thinking about it must be pretty good. It did its job well. But as always, that's just my opinion, and now I'd like to hear yours. What did you think of the episode? Like it? Hate it? Make sure to leave a comment and let me know.